So welcome to Accessing Other Dimensions on DMT. Um, we're very lucky to be joined by three incredible researchers today, uh, Andrew Gallimore, Chris Timmerman, and Rick Strassman. Uh, before we get going, uh, I just wanted to remind everybody that all of our events at OPS are put on for free. Um, so if you could uh, consider donating to our PayPal, we would greatly appreciate it. Rain will send a link in the Zoom chat. And uh, now I'm happy to introduce our speakers. So first, um, Dr. Andrew Gallimore is a computational neurobiologist, clinical chemical pharmacologist, and writer with a PhD in biological chemistry from the University of Cambridge. He has completed postdoctoral work in, com in computational neuroscience at the University of York and the University of Oxford, and currently works at the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology, Japan, where he uses computational modeling to study synaptic function and plasticity, as well as the mechanism of action of psychedelic drugs. His main area of interest lies in the neuropharmacology and ontological implica implications of DMT and how it might be developed as a tool for communication with intelligences inaccessible to normal walk waking consciousness. Uh, Chris Timmerman uh, is, uh, obtained a BSc in psychology in Santiago, Chile, and an MSc in cognitive neuroscience at the University of Bologna in Italy. He is based at Imperial College London at the Center for Psychedelic Research, where he led the first neuroimaging research on the effects of DMT in the resting brain, as well as its phenomenological features and potential clinical applications. His work focuses on the neuroscience, psychology, beliefs, and ethics of the psychedelic experience. He is also a member of the international interdisciplinary group ALIAS and is the president of the Foundation for the Study of Human Consciousness. And finally, Rick Strassman. A native of Los Angeles, Rick Strassman obtained his undergraduate degree in biological sciences from Stanford University and his medical degree from Albert Einstein College of Medicine at Yeshiva University. He trained in general psychiatry at UC Davis in Sacramento and took a clinical psychopharmacology research fellowship at UC San Diego. Joining the faculty at the University of New Mexico School of Medicine in 1984, his clinical research with melatonin discovered its first known function in humans. Between 1990 and 1995, he performed the first new U.S. clinical research with psychedelic drugs in a generation. His studies involved DMT and... <laughs> and published in 2001, has sold 200,000 um, copies, like, I could, I could copies and it's the oh. basis of a successful independent. Sorry about that. Apologies. I've also just turned off my camera to um, improve internet access. Um, and it's just the way that this uh, event is going to work is we're going to have presentations from each of our three researchers, um, followed by a 30 minute Q&A. So, Without further ado, Andrew, why don't you get us started? Um, okay, let me do this. Thank you, Kenneth, for inviting me. Thank you, everyone, for coming to listen to me. Um, first of all, can you all see my screen? Yes. I'm just going to assume so. Um, right, let me set a timer. I'm hoping that Kenneth's not going to be too fascistic about the time. Um, it is late in the day here, so I, I hope to remain reasonably coherent throughout, but we'll do our best. Um, okay, so I'll get straight into it. So psychedelics as tools for the exploration of new worlds. So first of all, um, please, if you're interested in what I'm going to talk about and uh, want to learn more about, you know, read my papers and watch my interviews and, and that kind of stuff, do go to my website, buildingalienworlds.com, where everything uh, is to be found there. If you uh, really want to go deep, then you can also read my book, Alien Information Theory, Psychedelic Drug Technologies and the Cosmic Game, available from all good bookshops and some not so good ones. And if you want to learn about the um, neuroscience of psychedelics in, in, in detail, uh, there's, a, uh, there's an eight unit course available for free on YouTube. If you just Google alien or YouTube search, uh, alien insect. Um, you can get that for, uh, for free. There's about 75 videos in, in the course in total, all taught by myself. Uh, and please do follow me on Twitter and Instagram, Alien Insect on both. Okay, so um, 
DMT. So this is what we're all, I think all of us are going to be talking about today. Um, I'm pretty sure that I'm very much speaking to a rather uh, the rather strange choir uh, of people interested in DMT. So I won't spend too much time, or waste too much time, really uh, talking, uh, giving too much background on DMT. But I think we're all reasonably fam familiar with the the basic phenomenology of DMT and this this remarkable molecule that uh, hurtles oneself into these extremely bizarre and inordinately complex domains that are often described as hyper-technological or hyper-dimensional, higher-dimensional, and often replete with this rather diverse uh, hyper-dimensional ecology of extremely intelligent uh, entities that are often eager to communicate with you. Um, a remarkable molecule and a remarkable place to which it grants uh, access and I think we're all here today uh, because we're fascinated by this astonishing astonishing uh, molecule and indeed if you peruse the online trip report literature you can find report after report um, uh, of these kind of places uh, these kind of beings these often highly futuristic it's very strange alien type technologies and strange machines and all of this kind of stuff. And of course, if you are to, uh, you can also refer to uh, Rick, who is, we have the honor of having with us tonight or this morning or this afternoon um, and his uh, landmark study uh, with human volunteers uh, in which again, we see these kind of uh, experiences. So I guess the question we all really want to know is, what is the DMT space and why is it uh, there? I, I'm not going to promise uh, a complete answer to that question, but I, I at least will gesture towards how we might think about the DMT space. Uh, and also perhaps why um, it's often not thought about in quite the correct way or um, anyway. Um, so first of all, so, so when we're, we're the DMT space is a, is, it's a phenomenal world. It's an experienced world. It's, it's a subjective world, um, which means that whatever we, uh, whatever we think about the, the ontology of the DMT space, whether we think it's real or what, you know, whether we think we're actually kind of going to some uh, alternate reality or whether we think that it's purely some kind of wild cortical fabrication, um, in, in either case, the, the DMT space is a, is a model of some sort constructed by the brain. It has to be. We know that the, the normal waking world, the, the, what we might call the consensus world, not the, waking, the world of normal waking life, uh, is a model of the environment that's constructed by your brain from information by your cortex, uh, but it is modulated by sensory information from the environment. So sensory inf information from the environment constrains the construction of this model. But ultimately, the model that you experience is, uh, or should I say, the world that you experience is the model that is being constructed uh, by your brain. And that applies under all circumstances. So uh, whether you're in normal waking life, whether you are... Uh, in the, in the depths of, of, of some kind of dream or perhaps at the height of a DMT trip, the world that you experience is always this model that's being constructed by your brain. So the question really is, is this DMT world, this DMT model being modulated by sense some kind of uh, extrinsic or external data source? Is there some kind of alternate alien sensory information source that, that's modulating it. And that would be a, a better question than simply saying, you know, is it real or uh, is it made up or that kind of, or is it a hallucination? Um, so very, very quickly, um, we'll do a, let's talk a little bit about how this model is constructed. So the, so the world model that you experience is constructed by, uh, mainly by the outer layer of your brain, the cortex or the gray matter. Um, and the cortex is kind of can be parcelated into these cylindrical structures um, built from large numbers of neurons that form a, a complex network. Uh, these cylindrical structures are referred to as cortical columns, which are thought to be the kind of the fundamental computational unit uh, of the cortex. And uh, so here we have a kind of a, 
uh, a schematic of them. And, and, and these little circles that you will see uh, represent cortical columns. So broadly, we can think of your, your cortex as being kind of like this, this, this mosaic of cortical columns kind of stacked together to form this, this three-dimensional mosaic. And again, somewhat simplistically, uh, we can uh, the, we, can, uh, uh, we can regard these cortical columns as either being active or inactive, kind of switched on or switched off, rather like a large board of LEDs, perhaps. Uh, and so the, the world that you experience, your phenomenal world, is a pattern of cortical column activation. Uh, every possible um, pattern of cortical column activation generates a very large amount of information because it's selecting from an extremely large possible uh, set of, uh, of cortical activation patterns. So at any moment in time, your entire phenomenal world is represented or uh, instantiated by uh, a particular pattern of cortical column activation and your, your brain is moving through these patterns of activation, moving through these individual states uh, of the cortex. Um, and, and again, simplistically, you can, you can think about uh, that different cortical columns are functionally, what's called functionally segregated, which means that they're responsible for representing different features of the world you experience. We have columns that are responsible for generating color information, uh, columns for edges and columns for movement, and then ultimately columns for forms and textures and shapes and even, even objects. Um, so the, the world that you experience is this unified pattern of cortical column, uh, an information rich pattern of cortical column activation. Now what the, of course this, this model uh, that your, your cortex is constructed, uh, it's not just any old model, it has to be an adaptive functional model of the environment, at least in normal waking life. Uh, and so, so your cortex has to kind of select from all of these possible patterns of activation, it has to find those particular patterns, those particular models that represent overall a functional and adaptive and useful model of the environment that allows you to, uh, to navigate and flourish and ultimately to survive, to pass on your genes to the next generation. You know, it's an evolutionary uh, model. Um, so, so if we think about all the possible states of the cortex, uh, we can think of that as being basically all possible activation patterns of all of these columns. Um, so we can, this forms basically a, a state space uh, and we can call this the world space uh, in that it represents all possible worlds that a human cortex can experience. Because of course, if a, if a, if a, if a, a human cortex can experience a world, it must be able to construct it, which means that all experienceable worlds must uh, fall within this overall world space. And the, what we might call the consensus reality space, which is the set of states within the world space that represent the functional model of the environment, um, we might call the consensus reality space. So we can see here we have the overall world space and then this consensus reality space. Uh, to get an idea of the overall size of this world space, I mean, it's very, very difficult to, to calculate the state space of the cortex, um, but there's about sort of 100 million columns. So assuming oversimplistically that each column can be either on or off, which is a oversimplification for sure, you're looking at two to the power of 100 million uh, states, which is a number that is practically, for all intents and purposes, infinite, and you can ask your calculator if you don't believe me. So what's happening then when we introduce a psychedelic molecule? So the classic psychedelics based upon uh, serotonin, these are tryptamine-based psychedelics, uh, such as psilocybin on the left here, uh, and LSD on the right, and indeed DMT is also a tryptamine psychedelic. And, and what these molecules do is that they, don't worry about the details here, uh, they interface with the brain at the molecular level, so the level of proteins. They bind to specific protein receptors uh, in, in the cortex, in particular, a, a subtype of the serotonin receptor, specifically the 5-HT2A receptor. And they perturb the intracellular signaling network 
of, the, of, of certain types of neurons within which these particular receptor subtypes are uh, embedded. And so you get this uh, perturbation of the function of the, of the neuron by perturbing its intracellular signaling network. Um, and then, so you're altering the behavior of individual neurons and altering the way they interact with each other, changing their excitability, for example, but other more subtle effects as well. Uh, and this then ultimately changes the way that cortical columns behave uh, and the way that cortical columns interact with each other in order to uh, generate your model of reality. So your model of reality, your phenomenal world is this high level, sits at the, the, high, uh, the highest level of this hierarchically organized uh, complex system. And psychedelic molecules perturb that system at the molecular level, uh, and this uh, you get these kind of uh, strange effects emerging at this higher level, which are actually quite difficult to predict uh, without actually observing the, the effects of psychedelics in human brains. So we get the psychedelic affecting uh, the receptor, which then um, has the effect at the level of the cortex. And, and actually, th these arrows represent the flow of information up the hierarchical system. Uh, and down it as well. So in the case of the classic psychedelics, um, this is how I described it back in 2013. This is quite an old slide now. Uh, what the psychedelics do is they, the classic psychedelics, they seem to override, they seem to kind of democratize these cortical columns and override the kind of the fine tuning uh, of these, uh, the connections between the columns. And so you, you basically, you get a kind of a loosening, loose up of the constraint provided by the, this connectivity. Um, and this allows the cortex to reach novel states uh, and to reach novel states more easily. Um, uh, so you get an increase um, get, uh, in the, the repertoire, if you like, of possible states. Um, and, and indeed, this has been demonstrated now a few years ago by um, uh, Enzo Tagliazu. Chi, maybe, Zuki, uh, and uh, Robin's group uh, at, at, at Imperial. So they, they demonstrated this enhanced repertoire of brain dynamical states. So, so in terms of this world space that I introduced earlier, psychedelics are ex essentially expanding this consensus reality space to include in entirely new states. Um, uh, from a, you can also think of the, the world space in terms of it, uh, like an attractor landscape. So you have low energy states and high energy states, states that are more easily accessible uh, and states which cannot be accessed so straightforwardly. Um, and so the consensus reality space occupies this attractor basin. And so these are the states the brain naturally uh, gravitates towards. The brain, is, the cortex has is, is effectively sculpted its connectivity such that it naturally tends to move towards these low energy states uh, which represent the most, most functional model of, of, of the world. So, so neuroevolution and neurodevelopment is partly about sculpting this attractor landscape such that the low energy states represent functional models of reality, uh, functional models of, of the environment. So what psilocybin or LSD uh, and the other class, classic psychedelics are doing is basically flattening out that, that, that landscape and, uh, and allowing uh, uh, a larger number of states to be accessible. And again, I don't have the reference, but I think just a couple of weeks ago, a paper came out uh, using some of uh, the data from the Imperial team that actually demonstrated this flattening here. So, so this is why um, psychedelics have, uh, have this effect. However, when we come to DMT, uh, something quite different seems to happen. We seem to go past this, um, this kind of loosening up of the, uh, of the cortex beyond this kind of democratization of cortical columns. And the, the cortex seems to kind of collapse into an entirely new type of behavior. It moves uh, rather than the consensus world, the normal waking world model being kind of loosened up and made more fluid and dynamic and unpredictable. Uh, what in instead happens uh, is an entirely new model begin. The brain starts to construct an entirely new model that bears no relationship whatsoever uh, to the consensus world model. 
And you often see that with, or sometimes see that with, with, with complex systems. When you, when you provide the right perturbation, uh, it can kind of shift and collapse into an entirely new, highly structured uh, type of behavior that is completely different to the, uh, to the prior kind of emergent behavior. So, so again, looking at the world space, I kind of visualize this. So we have the consensus reality space, the normal waking world, the set of states that represents the model of the, uh, of the environment in normal waking life. And you, you're seeing basically a shift um, to uh, an entirely different region of the, of the world space. You're seeing uh, that the DMT space is represented by states, by patterns of cortical column activation that are entirely disjoint from the states of uh, the consensus reality space. Uh, and again, in terms of the attractor landscape, what, what's happening here is in normal waking life, as I said, the, the, the consensus reality space uh, occupies uh, the, this low level attractor basin. Um, so this is the cortex naturally moves towards these states and these the higher energy states are inaccessible. So this is a highly ordered state and the normal stable familiar waking world. Uh, upon administration of DMT, initially you would get this highly disordered state. Uh, this is kind of the pre-breakthrough, uh, where it, the effects look rather more like a classic psychedelic, at perhaps quite a high, uh, a high dose. Uh, this is kind of the flattening of the world space landscape stage. But then assuming that the, um, the dosage is, is sufficient, uh, the cortex collapses into uh, this entirely new pattern of behavior. Uh, and what this is suggesting is you're getting a complete restructuring of this world space landscape, such that the formerly high energy uh, states that represent the DMT space become the attractor. And so the cortex switches and falls into this, um, this, uh, this DMT space uh, attractor basin and will remain there until uh, the DMT uh, is removed from the brain, is metabolized and cleared from the brain. So, so that's kind of what's happening, I think, neurologically. It doesn't really answer the question, though, uh, as to uh, whether we regard the DMT space as being um, real, so to speak. And as I said at the beginning, uh, I think a better question here is, yes, both the, the normal waking world and the, the DMT world, what I've put alien world here, this is an old slide. Um, they're both constructed by the brain. They're both models of some sort. We know that the consensus world, the normal waking world, is, is modulated by sensory information from the environment. We, we understand exactly how that works. Information through the eyes, through the ears, through the nose, uh, etc. The question then is, is, is this uh, this alien reality, this, this bizarre hyperdimensional, hypertechnological space filled with these entities, is that modulated by sensory information of some sort? In other words, uh, does DMT somehow gate the flow of information from some other place? Now, the the usual response to this, or a common response, is to say, no, of course not. That, that's impossible. That doesn't make any sense. Uh, but I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not so quick to, to dismiss it, and I'll, I'll explain why. Um, so, so first of all, what does it mean for us to visit? What would it mean? Let's assume that this DMT space exists somewhere, this world, this universe filled with these intelligent entities. Let's assume it does exist somewhere. How could we uh, access it? Um, now, the usual kind of naive way of thinking about this is that perhaps somehow you know, your brain or your consciousness or your mind or something has to kind of travel to that space. Um, so, I've, so I've labeled here universe zero. This is our universe where we are. Uh, and then this is other, so some other place where these uh, entities reside. You know, is, is there a need for kind of for movement in that direction? And, and in fact, no, there's no requirement for movement in that direction. All that's required is that there's some kind of mechanism of gating of the flow of information from um, other into your brain somehow, a, a, a flow of information that's gated somehow by DMT uh, according to some fundamental rule set uh, 
uh, that, that governs that interaction. And again, you, you would get often some protest from physicists, again, saying that this is perhaps, you know, almost ludicrous. And it's certainly highly speculative. But that's all you require, is the movement of information in, in, from other into your brain. And then your brain can then begin to con construct the model of that space uh, being modulated by that information in a similar way to it, the, your brain constructs the, the normal waking world in, in the presence of sensory information from this universe. So, so Ed Fredkin, uh, who was the, one of the founders of digital physics, um, he, uh, when asked, I mean, he often gets asked about the, the, the feasibility of, of, of computing universes, for example, and whether it would be possible. And he always points out that um, the constraints that are dictated by the laws of physics that reign in this universe cannot be extrapolated to places out, outside of it. Uh, and again, this is, he, he simply called this other. Uh, we can't say anything about uh, places outside uh, of our universe. We can't say anything about what is and isn't possible. And importantly, we, we also can't say anything about the rules of interaction between this other place and our universe. So it's, it's, it, it's pretty commonplace now uh, and makes good uh, fodder for popular science TV programs to speculate on, you know, alternate universes, right? Multiverse and that kind of thing, parallel universes. Uh, and one, you know, we can kind of extrapolate from our universe and, and speculate there might be other universes that exist and even speculate on the rules of how they might interact. So how in information might flow between them. But we can't do that with other, uh, with this other place. We can say nothing about, we can speculate perhaps on the way that our universe might interact in that direction, how information might flow from our universe to other, but even that's very tenuous. But we can say nothing about the rules of interaction between other and our universe. So this is what I call uh, the principle of unknowable uh, asymmetry, and that any asymmetric rules that govern the interaction between other um, and our universe cannot be known a, a priori. In other words, we cannot rule out an interaction between some other place perhaps a place that is some hyperdimensional space filled with entities um, and our universe. So how it would work is that um, in the normal waking state, your brain is uh, constructing your model of the environment uh, modulated by sensory information from our universe. But in the presence of DMT and through some mechanism of gating that we, we don't really understand, uh, your information can begin to flow into the brain in, in a similar way and your brain actually begins to construct a model uh, of this other place, experienced as, and that model is experienced as uh, the DMT space. So, so, so just to kind of speculate on how this might work broadly, and I have to be very speculative and can't say too much here. Uh, but before I, I spoke about the idea that, that psychedelics uh, operate at the level of receptors and information flows up to the level of the cortex where the world is constructed, uh, and also is flowing in the opposite direction as well. And of course, information as it flows downwards doesn't stop at the level of molecules. Information is always flowing all the way from the ground of reality, upwards and down through these cortical hierarchies through the, sorry through these uh, hierarchy of, uh, hierarchies of complex systems all the way up to the levels of the cortex so so my my feeling is if DMT does grant us access to uh, some other place does gate the flow of information from some other place to with, within which these beings reside that it's likely to take place uh, at a very very low level of reality perhaps some a level that we're not yet familiar with. So, so the DMT would, initial, uh, would initiate this particular change in the structure of the information at the level of the cortex, um, uh, what I've called hyperstructured information here. And this information, of course, as always, is always flowing in both directions. And so it's the type, this, this particular pattern of information being generated at this highest level of the cortex, uh, which somehow uh, initiates some kind of gating mechanism uh, at the level of base reality. And that allows information to begin flowing uh, from uh, other through a mechanism that we, we don't really understand.
uh, or, uh, you know, and the meaning of which and, uh, and kind of ontological and philosophical consequences of which we don't really understand. Uh, but then you kind of, your brain is then, information begins to flow from the base uh, all the way up again and kind of reinforce. So you get this kind of lock phase, you get this kind of uh, loop where your, your, your brain is essentially locked into this uh, hyperdimensional space and effectively temporarily becomes part of it until uh, your, uh, the DMT uh, leaves your brain and then you your, your your brain begins constructing the normal waking world uh, again so so finally so whatever you uh, you believe about this whether you, you do believe that this dmt space is representing uh, some other reality or not it's clear that the, the human cortex uh, has the potential to construct a vast array of worlds phenomenal worlds uh, and that dmt allows us to explore uh, regions within the, the world space uh, that we can't explore uh, using uh, you know, other, other means. And there are also many other molecules, many that we already know, many that wait to be discovered that allow us to, to explore uh, the kind of uncharted terrain, the uncharted vast terrains of the cortical world space. So I think I should end here. So it's for these reasons leading on perhaps to Chris uh, that uh, I think uh, DMT should be developed as a technology for the exploration of this particular unusual disjoint area of, of the cortical world space, uh, which is why Rick and myself wrote this paper back in 2016 with the idea of stabilizing the DMT state by maintaining uh, a, 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 stable, a constant concentration of DMT uh, uh, in the brain. And I think Tim is probably going to elaborate a lot more on that. So Tim, Chris, Chris Timmerman. Sorry. So I think I will leave it there. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew. And without further ado, Chris Timmerman. Great. Uh, just one second, I'm gonna share my screen. All right. Well, yeah, thank you everyone, everyone for coming. Um, it's incredibly hot here in London, so I'll try to prevent from collapsing in the middle of my talk. And uh, thanks also Andrew and Rick for sharing the panel with me. And that initial talk, Andrew, was great. Um, all right, so I'll, I'll try to keep, I'll get, timing as much as I can. Um, I'm going to be speaking essentially about where we are with our current uh, neuroimaging um, DMT research so far and where we are taking it in the future, which is essentially what we're starting to do now, which is starting these um, continuous infusions of DMT in healthy individuals. Um, so just to recap on, on some of the things that, you know, we'll loop back in a second. I think an important thing always to take into account is the main mechanism of action regarding classic psychedelics that we know so far. And that regards specifically the actions of uh, classic psychedelics on the serotonin system. Uh, more specifically, uh, the 5-HT2A receptor, the serotonin-2A receptor. So from a very kind of like a perturbational approach to understanding consciousness and conscious experience, DMT is well poised amongst the other psychedelics to explore that perturbation in an optimal fashion. And that's essentially because when you give it DMT intravenously, it lasts a very short amount of time, but it's an incredibly potent experience. So it's a very effective means to try to map out the space how, as Andrew says, the world comes into grips into some form of new sort of reality or world emerging during that experience and how then when the experience tapers off, how the system is then reorganized back into its usual ways. Um, okay, so also to give uh, a bit of, of of context and, and why this is relevant for consciousness research has to do with the fact that psychedelics, uh, and that includes also DMT, 
uh, is part of a human lineage. Uh, it's it's use. It's, it's part of a of several human traditions, which some evidence states that is uh, millenary. So it has at least four thousand years. At least it's the case of Anandrantera seeds, uh, the ones that are used in the DMT containing snuffs in South America. In the case for ayahuasca, we have you know, archaeological, anthropological evidence pointing towards probably hundreds of years of use, maybe even thousands, although that's not entirely clear. The important thing to mention here is that these are states, uh, these are worlds of exploration that are part of the human story and have been part of the human story for quite a bit. So any sort of understanding of conscious experience or consciousness that we currently have is absolutely incomplete if we don't take this cultural lineage or ethnobotanical lineage and chemistry lineage into account. We need to account for these states. Um, and given that in today's time, the brain is the de facto organ to try to understand consciousness, a neuroimaging approach to DMT becomes highly relevant. So what have we done uh, so far? Um, just gonna try to disable this floating meeting controls. Uh, we've completed two studies um, in which uh, we have administered bolus doses of DMT. Bolus means uh, an injection of DMT based off on Rick's uh, work in the 1990s. We did one study, we had 13 participants. We tried out different doses of DMT. It was an EEG experiment. And then we did a second study in which we had people inside of the scanner while they were wearing the EEG. It's a brief sort of neuroscience recap. The EEG gives you a nice temporal resolution readings of the brain. So it gives you an idea of how brain waves are operating. And the fMRI gives you a nice spatial resolution reading of the brain. So in the second study, we combine both things. So we have simultaneous EEG and fMRI. We published the first study, the second uh, we are about to submit now, and I'll show some preliminary evidence of that uh, to give you a bit of a, a sense where we're at in the moment. So for the second study, we gave relatively high doses. We, had, we gave 20 milligrams of DMT fumarate, which is equivalent to what Rick describes as the preferred dose from his participants. So I'm gonna to try to avoid any sort of extreme technicalities, but I think this is uh, fairly illustrative and it's fairly illustrative in relationship to what Andrew was mentioning. Uh, one of the main findings that we found is that the alpha wave pattern, and the alpha wave pattern is essentially what gets very yellow here around the 10 hertz band, um, completely is, is our dominant brain wave pattern in our normal waking state of consciousness, in what you know could be called our consensus reality brain wave pattern, is this alpha wave pattern. And we see that it's massively disrupted under DMT and that it's, it follows the intensity of the DMT experience. So the more intense that DMT experience is, the more this alpha rhythm gets disrupted. The interesting thing about the alpha rhythm is that when we are awake and we have our eyes closed and we are progressively detached from our uh, environment, this alpha wave pattern goes up. And it's because of that reason, it's called a sensory inhibitory brain wave pattern. Um, so the fact that it has an inverse correlation with the intensity of the DMT experience tells us something about all the sensory information that is felt during a DMT trip. Now, the in interesting thing that we found with DMT and that has not been found with other psychedelics and actually recently replicated by uh, another uh, team in Argentina is that while these alpha wave patterns were decreased at the peak of this DMT experience, we found increases in this lower frequencies, the delta and the theta range. And these are frequencies which are manifest as well during the dream state. And I think this relates somewhat to the possibility of what Andrew was mentioning, that in this transition into the breakthrough zone of the DMT experience, so the breakthrough zone, for those of you not familiar, has to do with this stage in which 
the experience no longer seems uh, a chaotic organization of stimuli, but feels like people are accessing some sort of other place, usually referred to as an other dimension in which people interact with these beings or these entities. That's, that is the subjective experience. We see that at that moment, there is this increasing in, in brain, brain, brain wave pattern, similar to the notion of, let's say, order uh, of some sort. There's a, a world emerging, similar to what happens um, in the dream stage, in which, in a similar fashion as in DMT, we're partially disconnected from our immediate surroundings, but nonetheless, we have a world of experience. Uh, and we've replicated this as well now in the fMRI study. Uh, the same sort of idea increases in delta or low frequency waves, usually seen during dream stages, and these decreases in alpha. And we've seen there's a very strong correlation as well with disorder of brain activity or entropy in brain activity and the richness of the DMT experience. If the slides are too complicated, just try to follow the narrative. I'm trying to make it as straightforward as possible. But the essential idea, as Andrew mentions, um, and it chimes quite consistently also with uh, the entropic brain theory, is that the psychedelic state, especially the more intense psychedelic state, is one dominated by entropy, at least on, on most of it. Um, and we've shown that with DMT that is indeed the case. There's this massive increase in measures related to entropy and this of course relates to this entropic brain hypothesis the idea would be that in our normal waking state of consciousness the brain or the system if you want to include also the psyche in that uh, would operate in a continuum between high entropy and low entropy or high disorder and low disordered states and the idea would be that in mental health conditions related to anxiety and depression, rumination and so forth and so on, you would have a nexus domination of low entropy uh, in terms of the states that's, that the system can undertake. Um, what psychedelics would do along with other non-ordinary states of consciousness is that it would push the system you know, into higher entropy states, uh, high levels of disorder or high levels of flexibility. And also here would lie the therapeutic opportunity, the idea that there would be a window of plasticity in which the brain can explore a larger repertoire of states and that this larger repertoire of states could serve as a, an opportunity for the system, an opportunity for people for, to revisit their lives and have a transformative learning experience of sorts. And the idea would be that uh, both in the DMT state and also for example, during dreaming, the brain would be habitating this high flexible, high plasticity states. And we have some evidence showing that so far. Another thing that we've uh, done in our research is the mapping out of the phenomenology, but from a structural perspective. So more than trying to approach uh, the content of the experience, which in, you know usually would be of interest for the DMT state, the nature of these entity experience, is more trying to understand how did this, what is the process of this experience over time? And what does it tell us about how consciousness is shifted in these states? And we found that the beginning of the DMT experience is one of increased bodily feelings, uh, bodily rush. This is also described by many of Rick's uh, participants in his research and followed by this high intensity rush that people feel in their bodies there will be uh, a state of partial disconnection uh, people no longer feeling they are inhabiting their bodies um, not necessarily having an out-of-body experience per se uh, or autoscopic out-of-body experience as people usually tell about when they leave their bodies and look at their own bodies but more like an ex expansion of their bodily states so that there is no longer an anchor in space and in this moment which happens around the second minute is that this immersive aspect of the experience would take over that that would be dominated by visual experiences 
if you want to call them hallucinations or visual imagery, that would be the, the phenomenon uh, specifically, the moment in which people most strongly relate with this idea of breaking through into some sort of other place or other reality. And as these sensory effects starts to taper off from the fourth to fifth minute onwards, uh, you would have what you would call an emotional or a metacognitive moment of the experience. So a moment in the experience in which people are making sense of what's happening. Um, they're trying to connect, you know, the, the completely outworldlessness of that experience with their everyday life. Um, so at, in a similar way as dreaming, you could say that DMT disrupts our constant negotiations with the external world. And there's an induction of a world analog of sorts in a state detached from sensory input, at least from the outside. So very similar to the idea of dreaming and sleeping onset. So it's a, it's a nice sort of explanation at two levels in the sense that we have at the brain level and at the psychological level, a similar structural thing that happens with sleeping and dreaming. You know, the idea of building a world in a state of partial disconnection from the environment. So using this neurophenomenological, microphenomenological analysis, we've been able to kind of like tease apart different components of the experience with different brain signatures. And essentially, we've confirmed that parallels uh, to a certain extent. The idea of these lower frequencies, this delta and these theta waves are uh, a signal for this immersive DMT breakthrough experience. The same with disorder or levels of entropy in the brain. Uh, another recent work that we've done with collaborators from the University of Toulouse is look at the brain from, uh, you know, from the predictive brain hypothesis. The predictive brain hypothesis is this prevailing view in neuroscience which states that very consistent with what Andrew explained. Uh, the idea would be that our experience is, no, is not as much dominated by sensory input, but more than that is about the models that we have built of the world. And in a way, sensory input would have a corrective function. Um, and we can using certain uh, analysis techniques uh, or analysis methods, um, it has been developed this idea that forward traveling weights in the brain are a signal for these sensory inputs, these corrective uh, mechanisms of the models and backward traveling weights would correspond to the action of these models per se. Um, what we found was that DMT would severely disrupt these backward traveling waves, possibly signaling a disruption of these models of this consensus reality, and an increase in this forward traveling waves. Uh, the idea that sensory input would now have a strongly corrective function of sorts, but if you will, in this case, a learning experience, or if you will, uh, an opportunity for the world to visit and construct novel worlds, novel models. And in terms of uh, our fMRI fan findings, uh, we found that DMT um, appears to induce global connectivity patterns, but especially in the more evolved areas of the brain. So the neocortex, language areas related of the brain, and the temporal cortex. All of these are areas in the brain that do not deal directly with sensory information, but it's more associative areas of the brain which integrate sensory input and are also involved in decision making. So everything that makes us human becomes uh, hyperconnected um, in the brain, if you want to put it in a very sort of simplistic fashion. And we've seen that the delta waves are particularly associated with these increases in global connectivity in these more evolved parts of the brain. Um, so an intriguing confirmation of our previous findings is that these lower frequencies of the brain, the ones that are involved in the experience of dreaming, become hyperconnected. The idea would be that the usual way that these 
connectivity patterns are functioning in the brain are disrupted and now instead we have a novel opportunity for all these evolved brain resources to become reutilized during this DMT experience. The interesting thing is that when we when we do analysis on, on these brain areas and we compared uh, along a wealth of uh, previous studies done in neuroscience in the past 30 years, this is what we call reverse inference, and we compare those maps, we see that the global connectivity patterns in DMT, as well as this serotonin to a receptor, the psychedelic receptor in the brain, we find that there is a correspondence with language and semantic related areas. So again, resources of the brain usually dedicated for the way that we make meaning out of the world uh, and the way that we symbolize the world become diverse. Uh, there's a global connectivity in this brain areas. So if you will, the idea would be that DMT would hijack these more evolved areas in the brain these are areas in the brain that also develop later in human life. So they are inherently plastic so that society can shape these brain areas so that we can become adapted to society and this makes us social beings. But the DMT would hijack these brain areas and therefore provide novel opportunities and maybe even provide novel opportunities that can have also therapeutic value. And one of the interesting findings when we've done this EEG fMRI is that when we've looked at uh, the signals related to entropy or signal diversity, we see that they're especially prominent in the left side of the brain and especially in language areas of the brain. And uh, I, I, I don't want to pose this as a, also a speculative means for you know, the theories of Terence McKenna, but there's something interesting as well with that idea. Uh, the idea that psychedelics are related to our language systems in a very intimate fashion. So broadly speaking, in terms of our findings so far, would be that uh, psychedelics, and this includes DMT very markedly, is that they disrupt uh, the usual way in which these more evolved systems are usually connected and they now become globally connected meaning that they free up resources and they allow novel information to reach us, uh, to reach the brain. Uh, so if you will, this is kind of like an idea that a mechanism of how the system gains new opportunities, novel resources under DMT and psychedelic experiences. So what is our current study? Our extended study, or we call it the continuous infusion study. Uh, what we're essentially trying to do is very, very simple. Um, in, the, in the figure in the lower left side here, you have the duration of a classic IV or smoked DMT experience, something that tapers off after the third, fourth minute very slowly. Um, therefore, you know, quite a brief window of opportunity to explore this state. And what we're doing now, we have already some, some subjects in that. And we've begun the studies, um, extend this for at least 30 minutes. Uh, we're starting off with 30 minutes. And what we want to do is generate a form of plateau of that experience so that we could provide participants the opportunity to explore uh, the DMT world, if you want to call it like that. Um, so that we can understand better what is going on at the psychological and at the neuronal level at the same time. Um, so yeah, essentially we've, we're doing two stages, one in which we're exploring four different doses and those parameters with the same participants. So each participant gets a range of DMT experiences. And then once we get the desired dose, we would select you know, we would select the desired dose, the ideal dose, and then give that to a, a total of 24 participants. And while we are doing this, we're collecting high density EEG. So again, collecting these brainwave patterns, but from uh, a much more advanced sort of perspective that would allow us also to have good level of um, 
spatial resolution. Um, also, would like to acknowledge that this work, uh, a big part of the work is also being done by Lisa Luan together with me. She's uh, my PhD student here at Imperial College London. Uh, also acknowledge uh, the intense amount of work that Michael Ashton, our collaborator at uh, the University of Gothenburg for the development of the model. I understand that uh, Michael has also uh, collaborated with Andrew and Rick uh, who published um, a version of the model um, in 2016, I think. So in a way, this is all part of, you know, we're part of this larger lineage in which, you know, DMT has been used for many, many centuries. And uh, uh, Rick has played a, an enormously important role with his investigations. And now uh, we're also continuing some of that work. Um, so. Now I'm going to speak a bit about the, sorry, this should be consciousness research. So what are the implications for consciousness research regarding this? What are we uh, trying to figure out from a consciousness research point of view? One of those things is coming to terms with this entity experience. So not trying to figure out whether or not entities are real. Um, this is a broader philosophical discussion. Um, that also can be traced back to hundreds, if not thousands of years, uh, but at least trying to tackle its neurological underpinnings and tackle its phenomenological or psychological components as well. Um, so in terms of phenomenology, for example, is this entity experience always an impersonal or metaphysical kind of experience? Or can it feel as a somewhat personalized entity experience. So for example, let's say when we have our day-to-day -day experience and we think about significant others, that has a sort of a very personal feel to this you know, experienced entity that we can think about. The DMT experience is characterized, usually told about at least, that these others that are met are of some otherness sort of quality, have this this very detached quality. So by exploring different doses, by exploring the space longer, uh, we can try to understand the appearance of this phenomenon, this otherness phenomenon, whether or not there is some level of personal involvement in it, or whether or not it feels completely impersonal or completely metaphysical in terms of a revelation of a different sort of world or a different sort of uh, reality of sorts. So that's one of the things that we could explore. Another thing is the stability of the entity phenomenon. Does it come and go? Um, for example, is, are there entity characters that we have entity moments in that experience? Or is there, if you will, a sort of psychological tone that permeates this entity experience? The idea that the DMT experience would have throughout it a feeling of otherness or a feeling of metaphysical otherness. Um, another would be the level of specificity. So at low doses or at moments of low intensity determined by the dose parameters, is the experience, for, for example, comparable to psilocybin or even LSD? Um, I, my personal feeling is that when you look at reports of people having experiences in nature and feeling that nature is alive, that feels to me as part of a continuum of entity experience of sorts, of otherness of sorts, somehow manifesting during a, a psychedelic experience. But these are some of the things that we could explore. Other things that we can explore, if we have sufficient amount of time and if we have a good neuroimaging technique, is looking at what are the basic mechanisms behind geometrics, uh, geometries and fractals experienced during a psychedelic session or a DMT session. So, for those of you not familiar, Henry Kluver mapped out the phenomenology of these, um, of the geometries, psychedelic geometries, quite a long while ago, I think in the 1920s, 1930s. And modern uh, neurobiological um, computational modeling has associated the structure of columns in the cortex, like the columns that Andrew was mentioning, 
uh, to the manifestation of these geometries. Uh, the idea would be that um, in some specific sort of way, in, our, in these intense DMT experiences and psychedelic experiences more generally, we will be looking inside of our own brains uh, in some sort of direct fashion, which I also think has uh, important philosophical implications of sorts. So if we have good resolution, if we have a good amount of subjects, we can look into these mechanisms, which are very relevant for consciousness research. And finally, the neurophenomenology of immersion, again, is this feeling of immersion of breaking through a gradual phenomenon, or is it discontinuous? Is it an on-off? Kind of experience of sorts. Uh, so, for example, you know, in terms of the phenomenology, we can investigate in a, in a good amount of detail how does a hallucinated or a visual imagery uh, sort of scene is formed, and we can look at the phenomenological level of that and at the brain level of that. It's an important investigation. And finally, what is the involvement of brain-body coupling for this immersion that people feel to take place? So some uh, preliminary results that we have from our previous research shows that brain-body connection, uh, and more specifically brain-heart connection, is severely disrupted during this immersive DMT breakthrough experience. And finally, the implications for uh, clinical applications of DMT extended or DMT continuous infusion. The first question, the most obvious, I think, is how does DMT compare to other psychedelics? So psilocybin, LSD, and ayahuasca appear to have efficacy at a transdiagnostic level, acting on core mechanisms of mood and addictive disorders, among many others. Some preliminary research that we've done with DMT with healthy volunteers show that like other psychedelics, DMT shows some form of promise in terms of clinical applications. However, it is usually said that because the experience is so short that, um, you know, the, the, the efficacy would be lower. Uh, people don't have the chance to explore that state a bit longer. Um, if we have a DMT, the possibilities of DMT extended infusions that we could explore to what extent that statement only has to do with the pharmacokinetics of DMT meaning the fact that it's so short, right? So if we make it longer, we might enhance those therapeutic opportunities. Um, the idea would be that would set apart usual DMT doses from psilocybin or LSD would be that during psilocybin and LSD experiences, for example, uh, you would have a back and forth of sorts between these immersive moments in which people are taken by the imagery, they're having these insights, they're having intense imagery and revelations, um, experiences of ego dissolution and so on. And then there will be a moment of integration of that experience during the actual trip. And then after that, they would have another moment of immersion, another peak in this graph here that you find here, here in the figure, allowing for immersion to come, to come through with the novel learning from the previous integration and then have again another integration session, again during that. So it's an iterative process that has a sort of spiraling upwards uh, therapeutic promise. Uh, with DMT, because it's so short, the intensity of it, you, won't, you wouldn't have this opportunity to have immersive and integration experiences while the experience is taking place. So this circulation of immersion and integration might be favored by continuous infusions of DMT. And finally, finally, what I think is probably the most promising aspect of uh, continuous infusions of DMT or extended infusions of DMT is the idea of personalized medicine. Uh, one of the most significant uh, notions, in my opinion, about psychedelics is the notion of set and setting, the idea that this doesn't work like any uh, other pharmacological treatment in which you would have a one size fits all sort of approach. But you would see that the experience is very much dependent on the characteristics of the person having that experience, uh, the idea of mindset. So if we can find, if we can develop a technology 
uh, and maybe DMT extended is that technology in which that psychedelic experience is adapted to the characteristics of the person, of the participants, then we would have uh, an incredibly fresh opportunity for personalized medicine in the psychedelic space. The idea would be that you could ad adjust to those parameters. So how steep is that onset of that experience? How much is the length of that plateau that people need to have? Whether or not you need to titrate the intensity throughout that plateau to a certain extent according to different indicators. And that could be real-time indicators provided by the person, biofeedback, psychological indicators, and so on. And this could potentially have implications both for mental health and well-being. And finally, uh, a brief note on some ethical considerations, which I think need to be mentioned or addressed. Um, DMT experiences, uh, also in the form of ayahuasca sometimes, can have lasting effects in the beliefs of people, um, in the notions of people of reality, this uh, breakthrough experience, entity experience, whatever you wanna call it, uh, has been referred to as an ontological shock of sorts. Um, this could be distressing for some participants. We found um, in some of our research that psychedelics induce actually induce uh, changes in metaphysical beliefs, which last for a long time. Uh, I think that this is something that the, you know, psychedelic research community has to start thinking about. How are we gonna address some of these issues potentially associated to this? Um, and finally, the potential for abuse. Uh, one thing that we don't speak about as well in the psychedelic community is this hedonic uh, psychedelic responses. Uh, the idea that people can have, uh, can get very straightforward pleasure out of psychedelic experiences and develop maybe even some form of psychological dependence uh, around psychedelics. I think with a technology like extension of DMT, you know, that, that is another opportunity, you know, to make the experience as comfortable and as pleasant and as pleasurable so that people want to do it again and again and again. And that combines also with spiritual bypassing and the issues along troubling revelations. And I guess that the kind of like my, from a broader perspective, my, my bigger uh, sort of question, and, and I think is really an invitation rather than a problem, is how can we develop cultural containers for these experiences to take place, for these technologies to unfold and develop in the safest and most ethical fashion. So for those of you interested, we've uh, written up a paper with a couple of colleagues around that, uh, which we call psychedelic apprenticeship. So the idea is how do we intersubjectively mediate these experiences of revelations, uh, of ontological shocks, uh, or of um, extreme personal meaning, and even spiritual pleasure, if you will, in the most safe and uh, efficacious uh, manner. So that's me. Uh, thank you everybody for listening. Uh, Rick Strassman. Okay, so everybody hear me? Yes. Good. Um, well, first of all, thanks everyone, uh, especially Kenneth and Andrew and Chris. Um, yeah, it's, uh, you know, it uh, warms my heart to see the advances in DMT research uh, that uh, have been taking place for the last you know, decade or so, uh, even longer. Yeah, you know, once I wrapped up my studies in 95, I thought, well, let's see if the rest of the world catches up. Uh, to what we did, um, I did, you know, my part, and uh, then uh, over the last, you know, while things have really been, uh, you know, moving forward. Let me get the view in a way that I like. Um, okay, good. Uh, so, Kenneth, you're uh, the speaker view. Yes. Um... I think in, in, there might be a way to, are you saying that I'm pinned on the speaker yeah. view? Or? Yeah, you're, you seem to be pinned to the speaker view. Is that just me? 
I think that might, I think there's a way for you to unpin it on Zoom, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. Uh, gallery view. Um, no. Oh, darn. Remove pin. Okay. Um, well, I'll just make do. Um, so, yeah. So it's been really, you know, great to see how uh, the field has advanced the last 10, 15 years. Um, I'm glad I've been around, you know, to see it. Um, you know, there's a couple of comments I'd like to make first before I go into my talk. Um, you know, one is that, you know, DMT is not just uh, a, you know, better Prozac. Um, I think, you know, one of the, uh, you know, problems with the you know, medicalization of, you know, psychedelics uh, is that they you know, basically are, you know, super Prozacs. Uh, they help depression, they help addiction, uh, they help OCD, they help eating disorders. Uh, so I think, you know, DMT in a way uh, keeps the discussion uh, more psychedelic. You know, DMT is very strange and it's a lot more difficult to, to um, compartmentalize as, you know, just another, uh, you know, super antidepressant or uh, one uh, or you know one new you know tool in you know the toolbox of you know modern medicine. It explores consciousness uh, in a way that's unique. Um, it explores um, a lot of uh, strange you know, territory, you know that isn't quite subsumed in the same way as you know the other classical psychedelics. Uh, so that's one thing I'd like to point out. Um, you know, the other <clears throat> is, uh, you know, the question of dosing. Um, it, it is true that the preferred, you know, dose in our studies was, you know, 0.3 milligrams per kilogram uh, of the fumar rate given intravenously. Um, so that is, you know, more or less equivalent to the 20 milligrams that uh, um, is being, you know, given at Imperial and at Yale. Um, you know, we gave, um, well, <clears throat> in our original, you know, dose response work, um, our high dose was, you know, one third higher, 0 0.4 you know, milligrams per kilogram, um, which everybody tolerated. Um, it was a more intense experience. Um, I don't think qualitatively different, but, um, you know, more intense. You know, we also gave a couple of volunteers uh, in the early stages of things, you know, 0 0.6 you know, milligrams per kilogram, uh, which, you know, caused uh, amnesiac, you know, delirium. So there wasn't much you know, point in that dose, you know, but I think um, in the future, the plasma levels that we attained giving 0 0.4, you know, could be considered in the development of the continuous infusion model. Um, you know, especially if you, you know, build up to it, uh, you might not want to start off with a brain level or a blood level of, uh, you know, which would result from, uh, a, a you know, higher dose, but once people become accustomed, uh, you know, to the state and the level that's, uh, accompanying the 0 0.3 dose, uh, you might want to consider going up higher. Um, Something else to the biology, uh, you know, back in the day, uh, I started my studies or I you know, wrote my you know, protocol, uh, my grant proposal in, uh, I, I'm in 1988. Um, and there was not much going on in terms of, you know, brain imaging back then. You know, the MRI was just, be, um, you know, coming into vogue, you know, functional MRI. Um, it was called MR spectroscopy at the time. Uh, you know, the EEG technology back then was relatively primitive as well. You know, so we looked at things from the neuro, uh, you know, from the neuroendocrine you know, point of view. Um, you know, there were you know lots of animal data, some human data about the responsibility of serotonin receptors, you know, for neuroendocrine regulation, prolactin, serotonin, beta, endorphin those kinds of things. Um, and also autonomic responses, blood pressure, heart rate, core temperature, you know, pupil diameter. 
you know, so those were our parameters um, that, you know, we used uh, back then, um, as well as our you know, questionnaire that we developed and, uh, you know, the clinical interview. You know, so all of these, you know, brain imaging, you know, technologies um, are relatively recent, uh, you know, developments. Um, so the stages that, you know, Chris uh, spoke about, you know, early on, we gave our questionnaire three times, or um, we didn't give it three times, you know, but we asked, you know, volunteers, uh, you know, to, you know, um, you know, to respond in our questionnaire, you know, to the onset, you know, to the peak experience and, you know, to the resolution phase, you know, so the questionnaire was, uh, you know, uh, a lot more data than we could actually end up using, you know, but it, it would be interesting, you know, to go back, you know, to those original, you know, those, uh, you know, finding, uh, you know, data with the questionnaire, you know, to see if, you know, visual um, effects were predominant at the earlier, the middle stage emotional ones and the middle or, you know, the late stage and so on. Uh, you know, we ended up just using the maximal effect as what we asked volunteers to score for. You know, so even if, you know, the physical effects, you know, were only you know, predominant in the beginning, um, you know, uh, you, you know, the, on the volunteers, uh, you know, marked, you know, the most intense uh, uh, experience of any you know, particular item. Uh, you know, the question of, you know, dreams, um, you know, a number of volunteers remarked about the difference between the DMT state and dreams, um, that, you know, there was a you know, feeling of, you know, solidity and reality, a consistency, a storyline, uh, which occurred in the DMT effect that was not comparable to what occurred in dreams. Um, you know, one of our nurses uh, in the room at the time when, you know, somebody was describing their DMT experience, you know, she said, oh, that sounds like one of my dreams. And the volunteer just, you know, gave her like a, you know, very stern look and said, it's nothing like a dream. So um, I think, you know, that's an interesting, uh, you know, question and experimental item that ought to be explored further. Um, you know, I have a uh, you know, question you know, for Chris in that slide with all of the words, um, you know, the language slide. I didn't see much in terms of, you know, vision or visions or, you know, visual uh, in that slide. So, you know, maybe, you know, Chris could uh, speak to that later on. Um, you know, neuroplasticity and, uh, you know, neurogenesis are, are you know, two items um, which were not, uh, you know, raised, um, you know, so far. Uh, you know, DMT increases neurogenesis and uh, neuroplasticity within the space of an hour in vitro. And the doses or the concentrations, you know, don't, you know, need to be especially high. So it, you know, could be that um, the you know, therapeutic effect anyway of you know, DMT is a result of, uh, you know, isn't the result of you know, the subjective experience. You know, David Olson at UC Davis is uh, you know, kind of you know, touting you know, non-psychedelic psychedelics as psychotherapeutic. Um, in other words, you don't you know, really need the experience. Um, all you need is the stimulation of neurogenesis and of neuroplasticity. You know, so his laboratory is inventing these non-psychedelic you know, psychedelics, which stimulate neurogenesis and um, you know, neuroplasticity, and in animal models anyway, uh, um, appear to be you know, therapeutic, uh, um, at least antidepressant and anti-addictive. You know, so the whole you know, question of, you know, do you need a trip? Uh, I think is being you know, thrown open to question. Well, so ketamine also uh, stimulates neurogenesis and uh, you know, neuroplasticity. Um, and it occurs within the you know, same time course within an hour or so. And you know, people are you know, proposing you know, that's you know, the reason or you know, the mechanism of uh, you know, ketamine's antidepressant um, efficacy as well. 
Um, and, uh, you know, to reiterate, you know, Chris's point um, about the potential, you know, therapeutic benefits uh, of the continuous infusion, um, I, th um, I think that's, uh, you know, going to provide a unique, you know, therapeutic tool, um, especially with respect, you know, to being, um, you know, to being able, you know, to go into the state more deeply and then to come out of the state. And to you know work things through with you know the therapist, and you know then you could say, well, I want to go deeper, or I want to stay at you know this you know lighter level you know for a while, um, and uh, you know you could extend it for a, a you know long period of time, and you know one of you know my you know fanciful ideas is uh, you know what are astronauts going to be doing when they're flying to Mars? Well, you could just keep them in a continuous, you know, DMT infused state. Uh, they wouldn't be bored, um, and uh, you know, time would, you know, go by rather quickly. Um, you know, if it is possible, I would encourage uh, the Imperial Group to, uh, you know, not do you know too much in terms of experiments uh, in the early part of the DMT infusion work. Um, I would emphasize, you know, characterizing the state uh, by, you know, clinical interview uh, without putting, you know, people in a machine or, you know, hooking, you know, their scalp up, you know, to, you know, multi-EG, uh, you know, leads. Um, I, th I think to characterize the state uh, in as experiment-free a, you know, situation um, as possible would be ideal. You could do that, you know, for the first year, let's say, and you know, then start actually, uh, you know, doing the imaging uh, work. Okay, you know, so that's you know, kind of my uh, what's the word, you know, commentary on the first, you know, two talks. Let me, uh, you know, get into you know my talk. Um, it's uh, you know DMT and the previously invisible, you know, psychedelics. Aristotle's imagination and reality. You know, so this is a more, you know, metaphysical, uh, speculative, you know, philosophical approach. Um, oh, let me share screen, sorry. I just spaced that out. Um, yeah, yeah, so there we go. Uh, you know, one of the advantages of not being in the research world anymore, you know, per se, like I have no grants, I've got no permits, I've got no funding, uh, I don't have a university, you know, position to, uh, you know, protect, is uh, I can speculate uh, and, you know, go, uh, you know, places with the work that might not otherwise be possible. You know, so I can talk about Aristotle and, you know, reality uh in uh you know with a little more uh you know cognitive you know freedom um so let me review the talk briefly and then go slide by slide um well so on the dmt state or any other you know psychedelic you know drug state is determined you know solely by one's individual biology and psychology uh these mind manifesting effects reveal clarify and make true previously existing more or less uh, you know, conscious contents. Uh, so the perceptual and the emotional effects, you know, therefore, uh, contain personally relevant information uh, that requires deciphering to understand and apply. So regardless of the location of this information, one's awareness of it is inextricably dependent upon who is apprehending it. Uh, so Aristotle's model of the mind divides mental contents and mechanisms into the imaginative and uh, the rational faculties. Um, so abstract notions are contained and processed in the rational faculty or the intellect, and all other mental contents occupy the imaginative faculty, emotions, perceptions, body awareness, etc. So I believe this is a simple and attractive approach to understanding the effects mm -hmm. of uh, you know, psychedelic um, you know, drugs, in, including those of DMT. Mm -hmm. um, so in this model, um, exogenous DMT may play a role in Aristotle's imagination, you know, providing the medium, for example, <laughs> psychedelic visions. 
And these you know, visions, meaning on the other hand, require the rational faculties operations. You know, so uh, the more developed the intellect, the more information may be derived from, uh, you know, from the visions. So one might consider the more real than real uh, you know, sense of the you know, DMT effect to exist likewise within the imagination because it is felt, not deduced rationally. So the recent discovery of a putative DMT neurotransmitter system in the mammalian brain, uh, which is being uh, you know, discussed as a result of the University of Michigan's studies, you know, demonstrating you know, brain levels of DMT uh, comparable to those of, their, of, so, of uh, you know, dopamine and of serotonin. You know, um, you know, raises the um, you know the question. You know, what would be the role of an endogenous you know, DMT neurotransmitter system? You know, so I'm going to suggest that it may be responsible for mediating the reality um, you know, sense of ongoing experience. <clears throat> so let me get to the slides again. <clears throat> So, you know, what is, you know, the DMT experience? Well, it's non-corporeal. Um, you're out of your body. You lose awareness of your body. It's, you know, populated. It seems to be inhabited. Um, and if, you know, not by discreetly discernible entities, the space itself is inhabited. Uh, it's interactive and relational. Um, it's, you know, something else and you're dealing with it. There's give and take. Um, as opposed to the, uh, you know, the mystical unitive white light kind of experience, uh, which is more you know, popular and easier, you know, to make up as you go along. You know, the DMT experience isn't, you know, quite that easy to just, you know, say it's all one, it's all the white light. Um, it's, you know, populated with specific information, specific entities, specific intelligences. Uh, the... Uh, you, one of the, <clears throat> you know, one of the hallmarks is the conviction that it's you know, more real than everyday reality, and um, at least in my study, the you know, phenomenological characteristics of this state were more you know, highly articulated you know, than the information contained in it. Uh, you know, the existence of this state and its properties were more you know, salient than you know, take-home lessons about you know, cosmic you know, truths, which were, you know, um, which were significantly more rudimentary uh, as, con as compared to the description uh, of the state itself. You know, so you know, the location um, is obviously of, imp of, of importance uh, it could be inner, you know, the state, you know, the contents of the state, you know, could be, you know, just your brain on drugs. The contents of the state could be your brain or your mind-brain complex receiving characteristics now being, you know, tuned to, you know, previously um, invisible, you know, levels of external reality. Um, but I think if you just, you know, call these contents, you know, previously invisible, uh, it's an umbrella notion that reflects our uncertainty. Uh, this location. Um, you know, Stan Groff, uh, you know, developed, you know, the idea of, you know, psychedelics being non-specific amplifiers of uh, the unconscious, you know, but I think they're non-specific amplifiers of, of, of you know, consciousness, pre-conscious, subconscious, unconscious, uh, you know, more or less, you know, conscious material, you know, so it isn't only the un, you know, conscious that's being made more manifest. So the psychedelic state, including you know, the DMT state, is completely dependent on one's individual biology and psychology. Um, if you give you know, minimal preparation uh, you know, to volunteers you know, like we did, all we you know, really you know, told our volunteers was it's fast, it's short, you'll be out of your body, you may uh, be afraid that you've died, but you know, don't worry, uh, you know, we're here to help out. You know, your you know, task is to, you know, go in there, keep your eyes open and report back as much as you can 
about what the state is like and um, um, and you know what is happening there. You know, so you know, we didn't spend you know ten to you know twelve hours you know, preparing uh, you know people for a mystical experience, uh, a, a you know psychotherapeutic experience. It was just you know have your own trip, and then we we, we can talk about it afterwards. You know, so in that you know, scenario, uh, you know, the only you know near death experience in our group uh, um, you know was had you know by you know someone with a uh, long-standing interest in the NDE, who had been you know, reading you know, books about the NDE and volunteered to be in the study in order you know, to have an NDE. Uh, the one mystical experience, the unitive white light state, um, was had by one volunteer with a lifelong uh, interest in the mystical state. As an undergraduate, he <clears throat> um, was a religious studies major uh, as a grown you know, man. Um, he participated in a religious organization that, you know, talked about the mystical experience, uh, you know, sought it out, you know, fervently. You know, the one shamanic, you know, death rebirth experience um, was had, you know, by an urban shaman who expected that kind of experience in his old age, but was surprised, you know, to have it uh, as a younger man. You know, so everyone, you know, had a trip which corresponded, you know, to who they were, you know, so you can have a mystical experience with a proper coaching, or you could become a more, you know, dedicated serial killer with a proper coaching, uh, which is the point I like to make when I, you know, bring up, you know, Charles you know, Manson and his followers, you know, so in a way, you know, psychedelics are, you know, panaceas, um, and, you know, panaceas work by means of the placebo effect, and it's a you know real effect. You know the biology of the placebo is still being worked out. There's brain changes. There's endocrine immunological changes. You know, the placebo um, effect is an activation of the innate you know, healing mechanisms of the individual, both biological and uh, you know psychological. You know, so I think you know this would you know, help explain the trans you know diagnostic efficacy that you know Chris was uh, you know speaking about. Uh, you know, they're good for depression, they're good for nature appreciation, for your meditation practice, uh, for, you know, sociopathy, you know, prisoner, you know, recidivism, eating disorders, uh, a, you know, new indication or of a new, you know, finding about what, you know, psychedelics do seems to appear every month or so. Um, and I think it, you know, goes both ways. You know, for researchers, you find what you're looking for. Um, if you're look if if you're you know looking for mystical experience, you coach people to have one. You give a questionnaire, and the mystical experience score is quite high. Uh, you know, Gazulos, uh, you know, Mayfrank, I'm um, in Germany a number of years ago. You know, gave DMT in um, um, within uh, the psychotomimetic model. You know, so she told volunteers, "We're studying psychosis and schizophrenia." And that's why we're giving you DMT, you know. So she gave you know, psychosis questionnaires, and you and you know, lo and behold, uh, you know, psychosis questionnaire scores increased on DMT. So um, you know, you um, you do you know find you know what you're looking for, you know, both as a you know volunteer and also as a researcher. You know, so I think that gives the lie to any you know notion. That you know, psychedelics are inherently good or bad. This just depends on who takes them, and why, and in what uh, you know, circumstances. Um, you know, so let's move on to well, to Aristotle. Um, so Aristotle would you know could be considered you know the father of modern science, and uh, you know his approach you know, to um, the interaction of the visible and the invisible influence, you know, the medievalists um, whose, you know, work I've studied quite carefully. Um, you know, the medievalists, uh, you know, the, well, you know, the medieval uh, you know, philosophers, you know, were the giants of their day. You know, they were trained, they were physicians oftentimes, astronomers, mathematicians, philologists, um, 
you know, they were the you know, cream of the crop of the culture at the time in Western Europe. And uh, they, well, I mean, I mean, the Muslim, you know, world as well. Uh, so, you know, they were you know, very keen on looking at, you know, the natural, you know, world um, um, and how you know, that reflected the influence of the spiritual, metaphysical, invisible world. You know, so for the Jewish you know, medieval philosophers, it was about, um, you know, the influence of you know, providence, you know, God's influence on the natural world, and, you know, how you could induce or um, infer, um, you know, the qualities of God from studying nature. You know, for Aristotle, it was the um, intelligences, the spheres, uh, those, you know, kinds of, uh, you know, hyper intelligences, uh, influence, which could be reflected in a careful study of the natural world. Um, and it was especially important for spiritual experience, um, you know, because, you know, spiritual experience or unusual, you know, highly altered, uh, esteemed uh, states of consciousness, uh, you know, seemed, you know, to the philosophers, you know, to be the you know, perfect nexus of the invisible and you know, physical you know, worlds interacting with each other as you manifest in the mind. You know, so Aristotle divided the, you know, the mind into the imaginative realm and you know, the rational you know, faculty, which I uh, discussed you know, briefly at first. You know, the imagination is corporeal, uh, you know, physical. You know, so perception, sensation, emotion, um, you know, the reality, you know, feeling, uh, you know, volition, those kinds of things. And, you know, the intellect, you know, uh, you know dealt with abstract notions, uh, you know, mathematics, for example. So, yeah, you, know, you know, the imagination is, you know, physically, you know, based, you know, more or less. You know, so, you know, one of the, you know, banes of, you know, the medievalists was that you could not, you know, really enhance the imagination you could keep it from deteriorating by staying healthy and avoiding, you know, bad lifestyle choices, you know, but you were, you know, basically you know, born with your brain. Um, and, uh, you know, that was the, uh, you know, that was, you know, the you know, focal point of, you know, the imagination, you know, the you know, physicality. Uh, you know, so, you know, but, you know, so stimulating the imagination was, uh, you know, kind of hit and miss. Uh, you know, you could study your dreams, you could sleep deprived, you could do those kinds of things, you know, but any, you know, reliable, uh, easily, you know, replicable, you know, way of enhancing the imagination wasn't available. Uh, you know, there was wine <clears throat> and, you know, there was opium, uh, you know, later on, but uh, otherwise, you know, not too much. Uh, so, you know, so the rational faculty or, you know, the intellect uh, was abstract and, uh, you know, cognitive, and it could be modifiable uh, as opposed to the imagination. You could study, you could be educated, you can train, you could live a, you know, virtuous life. You could think, you know, lofty thoughts, you can be around uh, esteemed individuals, you know, so you could, you know, modify your intellect, uh, you know, through training. You know, so um, I think it's, you know, worth you know, considering for, you know, questions of, you know, simplicity anyway, uh, to, you know, divide or to apply Aristotle's model of the mind, uh, you know, to the psychedelic state. Um, and I think as you know, time goes on, one could, you know, work out, you know, the mechanics, you know, the biological mechanics of the imagination you know, versus the intellect. You know, where do those reside? You know, what's the interaction between the two, those kinds of things. You know, this is at, um, at this point, you know, just a working model. You know, so you know, psychedelics, <clears throat> I think, stimulate the imaginative faculty. And for example, would uh, you know, be the medium for the apprehension of the visions and the uh, amplification of emotional states. Um, you know, so, you know, the visions and, you know, the feelings, on the other hand, require extraction by means of, you know, the intellect with respect to their meaning, 
you know, what did that vision mean? You know, um, what uh, are the you know feelings you know that I'm having? You know, what's you know the relationship you know to me, to my interactions with people, my boss, my family members, those kinds of things. You know, so you know the visions, for example, or the extreme emotions require unpacking, and you know the unpacking is the function of the intellect. You know, so. You know that you know being said. You know lots of people just you know trip you know because of you know the aesthetics, uh, you know the hedonic you know pleasure, um, and others use the effects of the you know psychedelics you know to improve themselves you know psychologically and, and spiritually. And I think if you um, if you if you adduce um, you know these you know metaphysics of Aristotle you could uh, conclude that, you know, the more highly developed your intellect, the more um, information you can extract, you know, from the contents of the uh, stimulated imagination, which occur with, you know, psychedelics. So, uh, yeah, um, a couple of years ago, there was a paper scientific reports uh, that came out of the University of Michigan, Jimo Borgigan and John Dean. Uh, I'm a you know, co-author of that you know, paper, uh, you know, demonstrating quite high levels of you know, DMT in mammalian brain and the co-localization of the two necessary enzymes in the you know, same neurons. You know, so this is a uh, very strong evidence, you know, for, you know, for the existence of um, of a uh, you know naturally occurring you know, DMT neurotransmitter system. <clears throat> so, what does that putative you know system you know putatively regulate? Um, well, usually you can infer the function of a transmitter through the function or the effects of drugs which you know, modify. Uh, that you know neurotransmitter, you know, so the SSRIs affect serotonin and regulate moods. So the belief is, you know, serotonin is involved in you know, mood regulation. You know, dopamine uh, is you know, modified by stimulants, you know, by amphetamine, for example. Uh, you know, pleasure and you know, reward um, is you know therefore understood as a function of endogenous you know, dopamine. Um, you know, so what's the hallmark of the DMT effect, you know, given exogenously? Well, it uh, is more real than real. So it's, you know, tempting to speculate that an endogenous, you know, DMT neurotransmitter system, you know, mediates our, you know, sense of reality. You know, so in other words, <clears throat> experiences or thoughts or things which occur to you, which are associated with higher levels of endogenous DMT, become more meaningful. They're more true. They're more real. That's what you you know focus your life on, and you know vice versa. If there's you know if uh, you know certain experiences uh, are accompanied by you know lower levels of endogenous DMT, you can kind of you know disregard them. So you know that gets to be a kind of a interesting you know question. Um, you know how is that you know system regulated? You know why? are certain experiences associated with you know, higher levels of endogenous DMT? Um, and I can't answer that. You know, so the relevance you know, to placebo, um, I think, uh, bespeaks an interesting you know, path or an avenue to the you know, regulation of a you know, system, a you know, neuro, a, a, you know, transmitter system in the brain, which uh, you know, modifies our you know, feelings of um, of reality, you know, so in other words, and I haven't really, you know, worked out this idea, you know, that well, you know, the last, you know, sentence of the slide I just, you know, came up with last night, uh, because I've been, you know, kind of, you know, loosely, you know, batting around the idea, but, you know, this is a you know, sophisticated audience, so I, you know, wanted to do slightly better. So, uh, one one question I would like to leave you all with is you know who is the question is you know, who we are the result of you know countless associations of certain experiences with certain levels of endogenous DMT. Great, thank you so much, Rick. Um,
So this was originally intended to be a 90 minute event. Uh, and I do want to be sensitive to uh, everyone's time constraints. Uh, Andrew is calling in from Japan and I believe it's nearing uh, 1230 AM there. Um, so I was thinking we would just take a few questions um, from the Zoom chat, um, just three. Uh, and, uh, and also, um, some, uh, and also um, one of your questions, Rick. Um, so I thought it'd be best actually to start with that question that you asked at the end, Rick, which I found really intriguing is who we are, the association of countless experiences with certain levels of endogenous DMT. I wanted to get uh, Andrew and Chris's perspectives on that. Uh, and also your perspective on whether or not DMT's function is just to mediate your reality sense. Sorry, who's gonna? <laughs> Whoever, you know, go on, please. Sorry, I, I, I didn't, I didn't get the question really. So. I apologize. Sorry, is, is my internet connection still not too good? No, 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 it's okay. I, I kind of, I was distracted by the the other question. Sorry. No worries. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, the question that Rick posed at the end was, um, is who we are the association of countless experiences with certain amounts of endogenous DMT? Um, and I think the underlying basis for that question was that uh, DMT's role as a neurotransmitter's functional role is to mediate your reality sense, you know, mm. uh, how real your experiences are. Yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult. I don't know who we are and I don't know. Um, um, I think that's, that's kind of the, the fundamental question or fundamental problem is I don't know who we are and I don't know. I don't know what's the kind of um, someone he, here uh, said that um, that I was assuming somehow that what we normally perceive is the most accurate model of reality. And I'm, I'm absolutely do it, doing no such thing. I don't place a particular, um, I don't regard the normal phenomenal world, for example, and our place within it, so ourselves within the phenomenal world, as being somehow the truest model of reality, you know, the real thing at all. Uh, I don't center that. All I'm saying is that we are normally, as ourselves, centered within a phenomenal world that is mapped to some kind of environment and that, that seems to be important. That mapping is very important. If you lose that mapping between your consensus world and, 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 the, and the environment, then you, you lose your moorings. Um, and, and that's really what's happening with, with, with DMT is you're, 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 the, uh, you're being torn from your moorings uh, into an entirely new space, which is just as valid. I always say that all experiences, all worlds are equally real. All phenomenal worlds are equally real. And when I say equally, I mean equally. I don't mean kind of about the same. I mean absolutely 100% because all worlds Every world you experience, every moment of your life is a single, is, is a state. You're moving through the state space of the cortex. And there's no way to kind of fundamentally prioritize any particular state uh, as being somehow true. No, we don't have that. We don't have that. We don't have this kind of um, lossless access to the fundamental true reality. And that's what, in a way, is quite frightening about DMT, um, is that you, 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 you are torn from your moorings. You find yourself in a place where, um, to get back kind of to your question, <laughs> um, where even your sense of self has been torn apart. And then you find yourself tumbling through uh, as this this point of awareness with no point of reference. There's the kind of uh, an existential absoluteness to the state um, where any sense of self, any concept often of, of, of even human existence itself is, is torn apart uh, and kind of you find yourself completely at, at sea in a metaphorical sense. Um, so, so yeah, uh, I didn't answer your question really, but I kind of, Got some ideas out there. <laughs> Just, um, I guess from my end, I mean, I would add the collection of experiences to our evolutionary drift as well. I mean, what makes us human, our structure, we carry in some way also the experiences and the interaction, you know, of previous ancestors with the environment as well. 
So it's our ontological and phylogen phylogenetically and ontogenetic development somehow, which makes us, and whether or not DMT, uh, endogenous DMT, assuming that it plays a, a, an important functional role, um, which I'm not sure, I'm also agnostic, I would wait for more evidence on that, but I, if it does, I, I would, I think that because these experiences seem to somehow connect us with the natural world through different cultural lenses, you know, being that from an indigenous perspective and an mystic worldview or a contemporary world uh, in which people are tripping in the park and they feel more in communion with nature and they change their values accordingly. It feels to me that psychedelics have this opportunity to renegotiate our coupling with the natural environment. And that, I don't know if that has a metaphysical uh, value in itself, but if psychedelics actually do relax priors and make us, and allow us to correct our models and allow us to learn more, then there might be, uh, I might diverge with Andrew on that in, in regards that, you know, there might be an interesting corrective faculty that these experiences can have in the way that we negotiate our relationship or coupling with the external world aiding for our survival. So maybe from a functional perspective, you know, some of yeah, those think, models are useful. Um, I think, yeah, I think what's kind of an interesting idea is the idea of changing this, this coupling, as you, as you say, there is, there's always a coupling to some extent when you're normally and awake, some kind of coupling between the world you're experiencing and the environment. But that cannot be um, like a slave, master-slave relationship where you, you have to have some ability to step back from the environment and, and judge what, you know, the information that you've been receiving and then adapt your models uh, as you're talking about that. And, and psychedelics, what they do is they modulate that relationship between uh, the, the model that you're generating and the environment. And sometimes it's quite a subtle change where perhaps you're allowing more information from the environment in or sometimes the opposite whereas with dmt perhaps you're you're, you're severing in a sense the you know certainly with a breakthrough trip you're kind of severing that relationship the normal relationship to sensory information uh, and, and casting yourself adrift and, and basically allowing the brain to kind of um to, to kind of do what it will Great. I'd like to um, move on to one of the questions from one of our audience members, Steve Hart. Um, the question was originally intended for Andrew, but uh, I think all three of our speakers can uh, answer it. Um, and the question was, why do we have a monoamine oxidized or any chemical for that matter inside of us blocking slash restricting the access to this alien other world uh, that you find on DMT? Well, that's an easy one, I think. Uh, right. I mean, monoamine oxidase are, are, are important for breaking down of, of neurotransmitters in the brain. So, so, so DMT is a monoamine, and there are other monoamines, so you know, dopamine, for example, um, uh, and, and these need to be broken down um, very rapidly. And so these enzymes are not designed to stop you getting into the DMT space. Um, <laughs> Um, it's not, it's not like some kind of conspiracy. I mean, that would be awesome, but if that was kind of the case, um, there's no agenda to stop you getting into the DMT space, uh, at all. Um, and it's only the orally, of course, that you, that actually really has an effect with, with DMT. Um, uh, but yeah, so these, these enzymes are designed to break down neurotransmitter molecules. Um, uh, and also in the gut, they're designed to stop certain other amines getting in, into the bloodstream as well. So it's just the normal metabolism and detoxification process, I'm afraid. Right, right. Yeah, you, you know, you need to be able to respond to your environment, you know, at a moment to moment basis, you know, so if, you know, if your know, levels of any neurotransmitters were staying elevated, uh, you'd be in a fix. Great. A uh, question from Marco. Um, how far into data collection are you in the DMT extended experiments slash what does the timeline look like? Uh, can you share anything at least qualitative from the run so far? Do volunteers report a stabilization of the world slash entities? I guess Chris is probably the one who can speak most of this. Um, so we, we're starting off, uh, we're, we're hoping to finish our first stage testing out different doses. And 
Um, yeah, I guess we're looking for people based in London who have who are committed and have a lot of experience. I cannot unfortunately share about the stability of things because we don't want to prime people into any sort of direction. And as Rick said, you know, you know, even DMT that feels authentically real can be primed. And um, so we're just trying to avoid any sort of like, we, we want to get as clean as data as we can at this stage. So unfortunately, I cannot share that Marco. And by the way, hi Marco. <laughs> um, Andrew and, and Rick, you, you guys both worked on a version of um, the DMT extended model. Um, can you tell us about um, perhaps other uh, trials of it that have happened, um, maybe even outside of academia? Um, or uh, is the Imperial uh, trial of DMTX uh, the only one that we have so far? Um, well, the Imperial one is the only one that's actually 100% happening. I mean, there's been a lot of interest and, and there have been a handful of groups that have uh, are, either have attempted or are attempting uh, to use this, this technology. And there's a, there's a team in Boulder uh, called Medicinal Mindfulness um, who, uh, who are coming at th this technology from, from a, a, a less, a completely non-academic really approach. And they're, they're kind of more interested in the state and using it as, as a tool for kind of, uh, you know, interdimensional communication with alien intelligences uh, and that kind of thing. And then there are also people who, who often email me and say that they've done it. I'm not sure uh, how, uh, accurate that is but they will they would say that they've because these this the thing is is that without wanting to give people ideas the although the the technicalities are quite um difficult in in the, in getting the model right the you know these these uh, continuous infusion machines they're not it's not like buying an mri machine you know for a few hundred dollars you could you could have one if you can get hold of one and but don't do it for goodness sake guys because um it's um yeah, it's not, it's not something to be done in your home, but, but somebody, it wouldn't surprise me if there were people kind of on the underground that um, had, had, had done this, used this kind of technology in a very kind of crude way. Yeah, there's a group in Switzerland, Martin Lichty, or Matthias Lichty, uh, who I think is working on a continuous infusion protocol, but I don't have firsthand you know, knowledge. Um, you, you know, you could, uh, you know, one of the things which inspired the continuous infusion idea is that you do not develop tolerance to repeated dosing of DMT. You know, so in our tolerance study, we gave it every half hour, you know, four times in the morning, and it was a you know, full dose, 0 0.3, and there was no tolerance. You know, trip number you know, four was as intense as trip number one. Um, you know, so if you've got the fortitude anyway, you could smoke you know, DMT repeatedly over the course of you know, however long you can, and you'd be going in and out of the state. Uh, for, you know, for sure, it wouldn't be a, a, a you know, continuous state. Well, uh, well you know, um, when you know, Terrence McKenna used to turn people on with DMT, uh, you know, his you know, protocol was you know, take you know, three big hits, then you know, take a fourth if you can, um, and in 10 minutes, I'll ask you if you want more. And if you can, uh, you know, sit up, uh, I'll, you know, give you more. The, you know, so if you've got, you know, the proper coaching and support, you, you know, might be able to, you know, go up, then just slightly down enough to ask for more and, you know, then go, you know, back up, you know, to the peak level. Uh, you know, but, you know, clearly a continuous IV infusion would be the most, uh, you know, technically, uh, you know, simple and efficient means of doing it. Um, I will also say that people, uh, a lot of people now are actually using um, these modified uh, electronic cigarette devices. Um, so like a vape, um, dissolving the DMT. Uh, with, so you have a handheld vaping device and getting very, you know, you, if you get the concentration right of this, this kind of e-liquid with DMT, getting very good results. And of course, it's much safer than using a, a, an open flame and um, people being able to very, quite um, get good, quite good control over uh, the level that they're in and actually keep themselves within the state for much longer. So if people, you know, if people want to kind of 
have some kind of extended stay experience, that might be something to, to, to look towards. Great. So we have time for just one more question, and it's from Craig. Um, he asked uh, Andres Gomez Emelson, who was uh, one of the um, first speakers uh, at OPS's term, uh, recently spoke on the topic of DMT subagents residing in normal waking consciousness. Are there any long term use studies being done on DMT? And to add on to Craig's question, um, if you've done DMT enough, is it possible to continue exploring the DMT world while you're sober? Um, well, so um, a number of you know, people have written you know, to me describing you know, that they you know, can you know, re-enter the, you know, the DMT state you know, hypnagogically, like as they're you know, waking up and as they're falling asleep. Uh, they're quite you know, similar in a number of people. You know, so that's you know, one uh, possible way of you know, re-entering the state if you're you know, familiar you know, with it from um, you know, using, you know, the uh, um, exogenous agent. Um, you know, the regulation of endogenous, you know, DMT is just being explored. Uh, you know, its existence in the brain has been confirmed. The enzymes you know, are co-localized, that's been confirmed. Uh, but what turns on the you know, gene, what turns it off, uh, still isn't understood. Um, you know, what is the you know, sub-agent question? Yeah, you know, what does that mean? Craig, could you uh, elaborate on that more, perhaps? Uh, so basically, what he was saying was you've allowing these ideas, these entity ideas, the incorporating within normal waking consciousness. So having the uh, a complete change in your worldview due to this ongoing discussion that you're having with yourself. Yeah, so like the persistence, I guess, of DMT entities or the worldview that you experience on DMT into your sober waking life, if I understand correctly, Craig. Hmm. Um, so, well, I can, I can kind of... Uh, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think um, so. Kind of uh, going back to the the other part of the question as well, the idea of experiencing. I mean, it's related to the idea of experiencing the DMT state after the, ex the experience has ended. And I think when you go into the DMT state, you, your your brain is, and your brain is a very plastic structure. It's highly complex, but it's highly plastic. And as you're experiencing the DMT state, your brain is learning to construct this particular model. It's an extremely bizarre and strange and kind of disjoint model from normal waking world model. Uh, but your brain is learning to construct it. Uh, and so um, I think once you've, if you've been in the DMT state for uh, you know, many times, then your brain is, is perhaps primed to con construct that reality. And perhaps this also could be related to the, uh, Rick was mentioning the, uh, the promotion of neurogenesis. And it's kind of a fascinating idea that, that DMT is kind of promoting uh, your brain's ability to construct its world, which has kind of got an interesting, slightly eerie uh, uh, ring to it. Now, the idea then is that what if these entities could maintain themselves? And that's kind of really cool. And I don't know the answer to this question. You're getting into really kind of metaphysical and almost uh, occult uh, territory here. The idea that the, one of these entities uh, uh, having uh, kind of ingressed itself into your, uh, your psyche, into, into your, your model construction can then maintain itself and perhaps maintain itself beyond conscious awareness. And then, uh, and then kind of um, express itself in, in other ways. I mean, this is really cool and interesting stuff, but I, I don't think we know anything about it. You can get into kind of Carl Jung and the idea of autonomous complexes uh, here to kind of think about these ideas, the ideas that you can have these fragments of the psyche that have been kind of primed or instantiated during a DMT trip uh, and then can maintain themselves even in its absence. Mm, who knows? Like being possessed, I guess. I, th I think I could, I could maybe complement that with... Um... There's a couple of contemporary phenomena culturally which I think are relevant. So one, for example, is uh, topomancy. I don't know if ever anyone's heard here of topomancy. Topomancy is like uh, 
it's a practice developed of, say, like imaginary friends, and there's a culture around it, like very instructive people, just like they train, train themselves to conjure up these sort of beings. And then they find out that the beings almost have like some form of autonomous functioning in their own lives. Um, and I think in a way you can make the parallel with the way, the role that psychedelic containing plant medicines or plants uh, have in the Amazon for maintaining and propelling animistic worldviews and cosmologies. And uh, the idea is essentially uh, the same, that, you know, you have this experience, you can call them learning experiences, you know, DMT experiences or a psychedelic experience is a learning experience in which something within you changes. So it, that could be a worldview of sorts. And let's say you have, to put in uber simplistic ways, uh, like you can have a center of cosmology in your organism, brain, whatever, or even the cultural systems that you have, depending on the scale that you're looking at things. And these experiences would somehow shift that system. But because you have experienced that, that has become a learning experience and that then you can just reactivate by, you know, engaging in cultural activities that, take you back into that. Let's say an Icaro, a song that people use in the Amazon. That could be a trigger. Doesn't necessarily have to do with the same etiological function of the experience of that entity. It could be that for different means, you, you access the same sort of network activating that feeling of presence. So I think it's, um, we're just tapping on the surface of these kind of extraordinary phenomena and at what level do they operate? The personal, the subpersonal, the unconscious, the intersubjective, and the cultural. And I, it's tempting to essentialize things to a single mechanism, like endogenous DMT, and when you take DMT, it's the same sort of thing. It feels to me that it's such a multifaceted complex phenomena, especially when it involves worldviews, metaphysics, metaphysics and cosmovisions, that it feels like DMT experiences are somewhat an igniter of these experiences but then become learning experiences for larger sort of like systems to engage with and reactivate by different means. Rick, did you have anything you wanted to add on there at the end? Yeah, I was kind of thinking about what I might want to say. Um, well, you know, taking it back down to the more mundane. I mean, I'm, I was thinking back to my experience being psychoanalyzed, like I spent, you know, four years on the couch up to five days a week. And uh, I got very attached to my analyst, and he became a part of my own mind. Um, and so, uh, you know, after I you know, finished analysis, uh, you know, for the next you know, few years, you know, Friday night, I would, you know, lie on, on you know, my own couch and pretend I was talking with him. Uh, so I think any, you know, um, I think any, uh, you know, intense or profound or especially meaningful relationship with anything other than you, uh, you can integrate, you can incorporate uh, into yourself and allow it in a way to, I wouldn't say it's autonomous, but it you know, feels you know, more or less autonomous. Um, and you can you know, continue interacting with it, even though you're not in that state anymore or in that relationship anymore. Great. Thank you, Rick. And thank you to our two other speakers as well, Andrew and Chris. Um, this has been uh, a wonderful event. Um, and thank you so much for sharing your insights with us. Uh, I know there are a lot of other questions in the Zoom chat that I would love um, for the speakers to be able to answer. But unfortunately, we are 45 minutes over. Um, so we'll have to conclude the event here. Thank you so much all for attending. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Fun. Cheers. Cheers, Rick. Thank you. Okay. See you, Chris. See you guys. Bye-bye. <laughs>